The downgrades of some of Europe's most high-profile sovereigns did not go far enough, and even U.S. bonds should be rated junk status. That's according to our next guest. He says while most European debt should be rated triple C, it could be time to get back into the region's stocks. Well, joining us now is Mark Farmer, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Nice to see you again, Mark. Let's get to some of your calls. Yes, um, my pleasure. You're talking about the fact that U.S. bonds should be rated junk based on U.S. liabilities. What are we standing at? Just over $15 trillion and 100% debt to GDP? I don't know. Why should that be junk? Well, the $15 trillion is already higher than $15 trillion. But that aside, if we look at uh, U.S. government debt, it reached 1981 trillion dollars, and in year 2000 we were at five trillion dollars. So between 2000 and 2011, we've grown three times, and the expansion of the debt will continue. And what the official statistics don't show you are the unfunded liabilities that are growing at a much faster rate than the official deficit. So if you are, are add the unfunded liabilities to the existing 15 or 16 trillion dollars, you're up to say 50 trillion or maybe 100 trillion, we don't know precisely. And that at some point will become burdensome. The other vulnerability of all government debt is the day interest rates go up for whatever reason, the cost of financing will become very burdensome. Uh, Mark, hello there. Sean Corrigan here. Uh, nice, to, nice to see you again. Um, yes, hi. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take issue with the sustainability of, uh, of fiscal policy in the United States by, by a long shot. But picking on the ratings agencies here is, is a little unfair, isn't it? Because what they're actually measuring is the ability of the U.S. to service its outstanding debt. And given that it has an institution down the road called the Federal Reserve at its full control. There is no actual issue about paying you back the dollars that you are contracted to receive. Now, you and I both know that yes, if those dollars aren't worth anything, correct. it's not great, but... That is correct. You're absolutely right. They can print money, and this is one reason you have, say, on the two years Treasury note or five years hardly any yield. People who buy these notes and instruments they know that the purchasing power of money is going down, so they lose per annum, say, inflation adjusted, 3, 5 percent. But they argue, I rather lose 3 or 5 percent, but get my capital back, then lose even more in other instruments. And that's why interest rates are artificially low in the United States and elsewhere as well, because the perception is that the ECB can print money, and certainly the Fed has proven again and again that they're the master at it. Um, Mark, there's another issue here, isn't there? Um, and good morning, by the way, it's Jeff. Um, just to throw into the equation here, um, yes, hi, the, du the duration of the debt. And in reality, what Italy's got seven years by and large, Portugal a rather modest 5.7 years, um, the UK's much further out here. Um, does anybody seriously believe that we're going to be in the same place today in five to seven years' time as we are at the moment? Um, none, of, none of this debt needs to be immediately repaid this year. And the total refunding for this year is only, what, about $600 billion on top of last year. And we managed to refund just about everything last year. So are we, are we excessively pessimistic about this? Well, I've seen different figures than $600 billion to be refinanced uh, this year in 2012, in addition, figures that in, are in, far no, higher the, than no, that. The, the, no, the point is in addition. We came into the year, I think, $7.6 trillion was the number that I saw. Uh, I, yes, I, I assume yes, that's yes. a credible number, but we did yes. $7 trillion in 2011. Yes, yes. So another $600 billion yes, between yes. friends with the ECB and the Fed and the Bank of England on the, ga on the game. It's not going to be a problem, is it? <laughs> As far as we are concerned today, it's not going to be a problem. But who knows what the mood will be in six months' time. And you pointed out rightly, we don't know how the world will look in five years' time. And that's why I argue we need to be diversified. And also, I'm negative about the outlook for the world 
for the simple reason. If you analyze why do we have a financial crisis, it was excessive debt growth and excessive leverage. Now we try to solve the crisis with even more credit and leverage. And that will just postpone the problem. But at the same time, between today and the end game, when everything collapses, could be that you have strong asset markets, uh, that commodities go up, or that precious metals go up, or in my view, I think that equity markets have to a large extent already discounted some very bad news. You say, Mark, that fund managers and investors are too short the market because we're going to see the Fed printing money and the ECB as well. So therefore, we're going to see all this extra liquidity sloshing around the market, which brings on the inflation and risk trade again. Correct. I think that in general, if you look at the performance of hedge funds last year, it's been actually rather bad. Uh, on average, they lost, say, 7%. Some done very well and some lost more and so forth. But the reason they lost money is that they traded and they turned bearish at the wrong time. Say, in October 2011, they were very bearish and then the market started to rally on the S&P from 1,000 and 74 on October 4th to now over 1300 and they were bullish in April 2011 when the market peaked out on March uh, on May 2nd 2011 and then started to go down and so forth so they traded essentially at the wrong time being long and at the wrong time being short my view is simply relax I don't think that equities will collapse. I think we have major support going back to August 2010 when the S&P was at 1100, I, I, excuse me, at 1010, and then we made a low again last October at 1074. So we have a lot of support around 1100. And if the S&P drops 200 points, I guarantee you, the Fed will come in with QE3 and QE4 and so forth. And the ECB and the IMF, everybody says, oh, we're not going to print money and this and that. But they'll do it through backdoor transactions and indirectly also. Mark, stay with us. So we're just going to bring another guest into this conversation and talk about the banks. Mark uh, Farber, uh, the publisher and editor of uh, Gloom. Boom and Doom report. Right, uh, overnight deposits at the ECB fell sharply yesterday, with banks parking just under 400 billion euros versus the record 528 billion euros deposited on Tuesday. Joining us now is John Raymond, banks analyst at Credit Sites. Uh, John, very nice to see you today. Are we reading too much into these daily figures looking at these deposits? Record levels, which tallied quite nicely with the kind of LTRO money that was borrowed last year. Are we reading too much into the, the oscillations here? I, I think maybe um, you know, people are, are drawing conclusions about what banks are going to do with the LTRO money, but uh, I, I suspect a lot of banks don't know themselves yet. Uh, what they've got to do is wait and see to what extent the capital markets open up and then once they've seen that they can figure out how much of this um, funding they need simply to, to refinance maturities are rolling over or maybe some of it they can use for extra lending or to do the famous government bond carry trade. Perhaps. There was a period um, I guess from about the middle of last year to the end of the year when we looked at bank numbers and we every time we saw a bank saying we have lessened our exposure to uh, one of the southern European countries <laughs> uh, they were rewarded and given a pat on the back by the investors who were going few they haven't got exposure. Now I sense a slight changing of the atmosphere actually. Now they've got this LTRO money, nod and a wink, you can put it into the sovereigns from the people who lent the money, but no implicit conditionality. Um, is it the same that when we look at where the banks put this money, we don't want them to put it in increased sovereign exposure now, or we let them off the hook? Uh, no, I, th I think there are different communities. Uh, on the one hand, it would help solve the, solve the sovereign debt crisis if they put into government bonds. But of course, the, an the equity analysts or the credit analysts or the rating agency analysts who are looking at the banks um, every quarter are still going to be worried if they have too much in government bonds. Okay, Sean. But, but I, the, I think the, the wider issue here from the way I see this is how much of this is actually new money and how much is just replacing a broken fun a, a f uh, funding mechanism. Let's take the classic case. Spain runs a big current account deficit. Germany runs a big current account 
account surplus. So a Spanish guy somehow has to borrow from a German. A Spanish guy borrows from his local bank, the German the exporter deposits in his local bank, and his bank used to lend it back to the Spanish bank. They don't do this anymore. The German bank puts it with the Bundesbank, the Bundesbank does a target transfer to the Bank of Spain, and the Bank of Spain does a repo with the Spanish bank. So the ECB balance sheet shoots up, deposits shoot up, there's no new money in the system. We just put a link in, a credit wrap, uh, an extra interbank chain in here, there's nothing new. Now, some of the ECB money may be new money, and some of it just may be replacing things that people don't want to lend directly to one another at the moment. I and mean, this is the issue, surely. Yeah, here. I think that's right. It's a redistribution mechanism, and, and luckily, <laughs> uh, the ECB is there to do it. But that's what's happening. I mean, you can see the, the taking of funding uh, really going up um, from the Italian banks, the Spanish banks, even the French banks. Um, and then you can see the placing of deposits really going up among the Germans and others who call Eurozone banks. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Mark, let's bring you back into the conversation. Um, if that's true, um, to what extent is the ECB expanding its balance sheet at the moment the real reason for the euro weakening? Well, it expanded over the last three months, the balance sheet, extensively. But I'd like to just mention one point about the banks. I live in Asia. I can tell you that in countries like Thailand or India or Indonesia, the banks have essentially zero exposure to European sovereign bonds. And for an investor, in my view, both the depositor, say I have deposits with Siam Commercial Bank in Thailand, I feel much safer to have that deposit than, say, fiduciary deposits with Swiss banks that then lend it out to all kinds of institutions. I have no idea about what these institutions are doing. Equally, if you are a buyer of shares, you probably, not as a trade, maybe as a trade, banks in Europe and in the US can rebound, but as an investment for the longer term, I think you're much better off in some of these Indian banks and Thai banks and Singapore banks. Well, I don't want to sound complacent and be contradictory, Mark, but the World Bank just came out and told us that uh, emerging economies should be on their guard for falling growth rates. These banks in Asia you're talking about are falling over themselves, aren't they, still to lend into their domestic economy to companies that they think are going to benefit from selling to the West? Well, actually, there is a misconception that a large portion of the Asian economies depend on exports to the West. Yes, it's part of their business, but over the last 10 years, we have had the emergence of very significant domestic markets. I give you an example. I travel regularly between Bangkok and Chiang Mai by plane because I travel overseas, so I come back to Bangkok and I connect to Chiang Mai. Say 10 years ago, you had largely foreigners in the plane, and today the predominant traffic is actually locals that travel from Bangkok to Chiang Mai for holidays or to visit their girlfriends or to go to their second homes and so forth and so on. The same in Indonesia, I was recently on the Komodo Island. The bulk of tourism was local tourism from Jakarta and not foreigners. And so I think the perception in the West is, oh, the whole world depends on the Western world. That is no longer the case. The locals have found the Four Seasons Hotel in Chiang Mai, a beautiful part of the world. John, as you match up some of the, these calls we're hearing from Mark, some of these Asian banks, the likes of Bank Midiri, DBS, how do they stack up to the outperform recommendations you have, your BNP Paribas you've got on your list, uh, KBC, Lloyd's Banking Group? Do you think Mark's argument holds true that the strong consumer markets, uh, domestic markets in Asia might hold more appeal than these traditional markets here and the stocks you're looking at? Uh, yes, I think that's right. Um, it's going to be easier for banks there to make money, I think, in general. I mean, in, in Europe, most of our outperform calls are on the basis that um, it's not that we love the stories, it's more that spreads have widened to a degree that we think they might actually come, you know, improve from here. But the, uh, there are very few opportunities where you, for banks to, to make really good money the way that they were um, heading into the crisis. We think ROEs are going to remain depressed, you know, a lot of them in the, in the single digits still. Um, while banks rebuild their capital ratios. Got to let you go, John. Thanks very much for coming in. John Raymond, Banks yeah. Analyst at Credit Sites. Mark, you bear with us for a moment, if you can, and we'll come back to you and pick up the conversation in just a moment. It is my pleasure.